why don't people go to church anymore? This is a question that a friend of mine asked on Facebook this last week. And you know like when you're a little kid and there's a scary movie and you cover your eyes but you kind of open it because you kind of still want to see what happens? That's kind of how I approach this question. Why do people not go to church? I don't really want to know, but I kind of do. And now the answers were predictable. You don't have to go to church to be a good person or to have a spiritual life. Some people talked about the, the connection, the increasing connection between politics and the church that, that turns them off. But I think the most emotionally powerful answer was that people who are, are in the church seem to them to be hypocritical and holier than thou. Right? That the people in the church act as if they have it all morally figured out and the rest of us are just bad people. So holier than thou and hypocritical. Any of you ever met somebody like that? No, don't, don't answer. Don't answer. Yeah, they exist in our world, uh, maybe even sometimes in the mirror, but they exist in our world. Uh, and they existed in Jesus' day too. And in fact, Jesus today meets somebody who likely has a very hypocritical and holier-than-thou side, and that's Nicodemus. And the reason why I know that about Nicodemus is because Nicodemus is a Pharisee. A little bit of biblical background, right? Jesus is a first century Jew who lives in Israel, Palestine, and there's all sorts of groups in that society, and one of those groups is the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, well, see, they saw that the Roman Empire had taken over, and uh, that wherever they looked, there were Roman soldiers, and they had to pay taxes with the, the head of Julius Caesar and so forth on them. And, and they felt that their culture then was, was under siege, and what really got to them wasn't just that they didn't have control over the laws, but that they worried about the faith and piety of the people. You see that their tax dollars were going to fund temples of pagan gods in which there were big idols, and temple prostitution was a form of worship. And they felt as if, again, they were going to lose their, their children, lose the next generation to this sort of this, this pagan force out there, so they needed an anchor. And what they chose as an anchor was to follow all the laws of the Old Testament, whether it's about what kind of cloth you have in your clothing and so forth. But they said, if we can follow the teachings of our ancestors, then we can have an anchor against this sort of pagan storm that's taking over our people. And so it was, a, it was really a, a holy movement, a desire for God's kingdom in a broken world. But any Pharisee project, anytime we decide to base our life on obedience to a certain set of laws, two things happen. One is that we get blind to God's love. We focus too much on the letter of the law. And the other is that we get blind to our own mistakes and our own sins and the rather random way in which we've chosen certain laws and not others. Again, we, we get blind to God's love and we get blind to our own sinfulness when we decide my life is going to be about living certain laws. But we know that uh, just as there were Pharisees then, there are, there are Pharisees and there's a Pharisee project in our, in our world today. And, you know, I, and I, and I kind of get it. You know, when you think about the last 50 to 60 years in our culture, there's been so much that has changed. So much. I think for, for many people, especially of an older generation, they wake up, and I think many of you probably say, like, am I still living in the same country that I grew up in? Just, again, profound changes around family and nation and church. And it's so disorienting, I think, for a lot of people that there's this sense that there's sort of this, this pagan storm that is just sort of taking over our culture, and we need an anchor we need something that's going to sort of help us weather this storm. And so many people then choose to say, I want to cling to the teachings of our ancestors. I want to hold to the way that it, it used to be, lest again we just get overwhelmed by this sort of secular pagan wave coming. As always, of course, though, there are those problems with any Pharisee project of a, a blindness to God's love and a blindness to our own. But the Pharisee project is out there. And I'm curious how you interact with Pharisees in your life. 
Maybe for some of you, in fact, you, you have such an anxiety about that sort of that culture change that has come that you say, hey, I actually want to cling to the teachings. I want to cling to the way that life was. And in fact, I want my pastor to preach a few more Helen Brimstone sermons and kind of get us back on track here, right? This is what Lent is an invitation to, to return to the Lord. Maybe for some of you, though, you've really been hurt by Pharisees. Maybe at some point in your life you were told that you were not worthy of God's love, that you were less than because of how you act or, or who you are. Or maybe somebody in your family has experienced that. Or maybe, again, even though it's only one interaction, you've, you've lived with that voice just so long in your ear that says you're not worthy of God's love. Maybe for some of you, you're a bit like Nicodemus, though. At one point, you, you sort of you drank the Kool-Aid of the Pharisees. You were into that project, but, but now you're, you're sort of like Nicodemus and you're saying there's, there's more to the kingdom of God than just this obedience to a set of laws. I'm hungry for something else, but I'm not quite sure what else is out there. And maybe some of you, maybe some of you are simply angry. Angry that in many ways American Christianity, the public face of it has been hijacked by the Pharisee project. And that no matter what we do, people outside will think of us as Pharisees in spite of our best intentions. And, and maybe, again, for some of you, that just makes you so, so angry and upset. So the Pharisee project is out there, and we're all sort of interacting and dealing with its reality in our modern world. In fact, I've met many people who... They're so angry and so wanting to avoid the, the Pharisee project that they sort of go the other way and they, they sort of want to be the, the anti sort of religious Pharisees. And so then they, they uh, adopt, um, but they actually never reject really the Pharisee project. They just change which laws they want to follow. They exchange the Republican national platform for the Democratic one. Did I say that? Whoops, sorry about that. Right? I have met plenty of conservative Pharisees in my life, and I've met plenty of progressive Pharisees in my life. People who have decided that if we don't follow a certain set of laws, that it's all just going to fall apart. I was listening to an environmental podcast the other day, and it was about food in the grocery store and your carbon footprint. And I was curious, you know, what, what foods are better for the earth and so forth. But what was clear in the podcast was that the, the people that were speaking, not only were they very judgmental of people that wouldn't have the same concerns, but they were sort of lamenting their hypocrisy as they learned that the foods that they had looked down on other people for buying were actually better than they thought. Again, wherever we go, we sort of can't escape this Pharisee project, this sense that if we just lived the right laws, the kingdom of God, the salvation of the earth would, would finally come about, and inevitably we then run into this problem. The Pharisee project always leads to blindness, to mercy and love, and the Pharisee project always leads to blindness about our own limitations. So what shall we do? Is there another way forward? Well, Jesus today, when he encounters Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, this, this Pharisee project that you're on, it's, it's not about you. you. You can't actually bring about the kingdom of God by doing the right thing, Nicodemus. It's about where the Spirit blows. It's about what the Spirit wants to do, not about what you want to do. And ultimately, then, even Jesus points towards a cross and says that ultimately the Son of Man will need to be raised up on a pole that all can see. What does this concretely mean? I'd, I'd like to offer that, that we're called to be a confessing church. And by a confessing church, I mean at the very least a church that when we gather on, on Sunday mornings, we don't simply congratulate each other's righteousness and say, wow, we're, we're so good at what we do. But rather, we begin worship with this really kind of difficult thing. We actually all acknowledge our sins. And instead of going to God and saying, God, look how great of a person I am, we, we actually start our worship service and we say, 
I confess that I am in bondage. I am captive to sin, that I have sinned against you, O Lord, in thought, word, and deed by what I've done and but what I have left undone. And this is obviously a powerful moment for us and God. We can go to God vulnerably and say, this is who I am, and receive the good news that although our sin may be great, indeed is great, Jesus Christ's love and mercy is greater. But I think part of the power of, of confession actually isn't simply between us as individuals and God, but each other. Again, I think the real power of confession is not just between us and God, but us and each other. Because what it does is it says we, we all gather today. And when we confessed, I got to hear you all say this, and you got to hear me say that, and we got to hear each other say that we all have sinned this last week. And so what this means is that, you know, in spite of the fact uh, of how great my, my Facebook feed may make my life look, no matter how much my, my lawn is mowed, that my shoes are shined, it's an acknowledgement that I and you, that on the inside, we're both hurting. We're hurting because of what we have done. We're hurting because of what has been done to us. And we're all facing these situations in our family where we just can't even figure out where my need for forgiveness and their need for forgiveness begins and ends. We're, we're all facing situations that, that require strength more than, than we can offer, that, that force us to say, Lord, have mercy. And so we begin worship like an AA meeting by saying, hi, I'm Rob and I'm a sinner. And then at the end, in case we didn't get it the first time, we all gather around the communion table, kneeling and put out our arms and say, Lord, have mercy. Again, there's a way in which we're a confessing church, a church that has not ignored the law, but instead is acknowledging uh, that the orientation, the foundation of our life is not our own doing, but God's grace for us. And I, think, and I think actually the world is hungry for this kind of church. One of the strange curiosities is that every year you all actually show up for Ash Wednesday service. I mean, every year I kind of wonder, are people going to show up this year? Because what I've noticed as a pastor is that we no longer want to talk about death. We don't call them funerals. They're celebrations of life. But here, people just keep coming. People just keep coming and they, they want a, a cross of ashes on their forehead. This year, in fact... Um, I ended up doing six Ash Wednesday services. There were teachers from the CELC that said they had missed it and they wanted it, so I did extra services. I did six services in which we confessed our sins, in which we had a cross marked on us. And I think there's a hunger for it because it's, it's nice in a world where we always have to project that our lives are together, where we can finally be honest. Be honest with ourselves that we're mortal. The death hurts, the grief is real, that we all need to repent, that we all need fundamentally God's grace. And then to receive a sign, not just of humility, but of profound hope that in the cross of Christ there actually is hope, that there is another foundation of this world beneath my own actions, and that's the love and mercy of Christ that is so deep and wide. And on that we can build, and on that we can live and have everlasting life. Now, I suppose I should end my sermon there. It would be a good time to wrap it up. But the story of Nicodemus doesn't end there. Nicodemus, it's, it's not enough for Nicodemus simply to have had a private moment with Jesus. But Nicodemus comes back into the Gospel of John twice. And, and when he comes back, he's going to have to, in front of the other Pharisees, and finally in front of the, the whole world, he's going to have to confess Christ in his actions as he finally carries the body of the crucified Christ and helps bury him. Being a confessing church doesn't simply mean that on Sunday we say pious prayers. It is, of course, about how we live our life in the real world and how through our, our words and our deeds we confess Christ. There, there are decisions. There are family members we have to negotiate. 
There are political realities. There's realities in our business. Today, we're celebrating the Christian Early Learning Center. And, and every day, there's got to be decisions about how to keep kids safe and so forth. Again, we have to live in this real world. And that's where we're called to confess Christ, not simply in our prayers, but in our actions. And when we do that, again, hopefully we do so with some humility. But if we can seek to confess Christ with our, our words and our actions, ultimately what will happen to us is what happened to Nicodemus, and that is that we'll discover the cross. We'll discover the cross. We'll discover that time and that place when finally we're pushed beyond ourselves where we are pushed beyond the borders of our comfort and our trust, where we cry out in the liturgy, Lord, have mercy, where we cry out with the psalmist, from where will my help come? And then with joy, we can return. We can return after a week and once again confess our shortcomings. But have our eyes opened. Our eyes opened not simply to our limitations, but to God's love. God's love for our adversaries, but God's love for you as we hear that indeed we can lift our eyes to the hills. For we know that our help does come from the Lord, the one who was crucified and risen for you. And then we can confess joyfully the power of Christ and his resurrection.